All right, so the recording has started. Um, looks like everything is good on my end now. Um, this chapter is about ray optics, so you'll learn about light rays, how they refract, reflect, how to draw them, how to figure out where an image is formed, um, and stuff like that. So two kind of main topics that this week covers, and those are propagation of light and geometric optics. So let's start off with propagation of light first. And before we even like get into anything about like how light is reflect reflected or refracted or any of that, we obviously have to understand like some specific information about light itself, right? So the speed of light, we denote that with the variable c, right? Little c like that. We denote it with that variable. Um, and c, the speed of light is three times ten to the eighth meters per second, right? That's the speed of light through a vacuum, right? So that is one value that we have that we know of for the speed of light. But the question is, does the speed of light then differ in other types of materials, right? Because light can pass through water, can pass through, you know, air, like we said, with the vacuum, it could pass through other materials. So the question is, does this speed of light stay constant or does it change depending on the material that you're going through, right? And so the speed of light does indeed change. It differs based on the material that the light is passing through, right? And there's a constant, right, a value, right, a specific constant that describes the speed of light in that specific material, right? And that's called the index of refraction. Um, and so this index of refraction is denoted with the variable lowercase n, like this, right? And that is a ratio of the normal, like, speed of light, right, um, that we have, that we know for a vacuum, and then divided by the speed, the actual speed, um, of light in that specific material, right? So the index of refraction, for example, for a vacuum would just be one, right? Because speed of light, which is three times 10 to the eighth, that's your C, is divided by three times 10 to the eighth because that's the actual speed of light through a vacuum, right? So three times 10 to the eighth divided by three times 10 to the eighth should just give you one. And then based on different types of materials like water, um, like, let's say like wood or something like that, right? you'll have differing, differing uh, indices of a refraction, right? So you might have three times 10 to the eighth, but then the actual speed might actually be like one times 10 to the seventh or something like that, right? And then you have to actually have to calculate out the index of refraction, whatever that is, right? Alternatively, if you have the index refraction um, and you have your speed of light, obviously, which is three times 10 to the eighth, then you can figure out the actual speed of light through that specific material just by rearranging the equation, right? Um, and the index of refraction is always greater than or equal to one, right? Because um, essentially like speed of light will be fastest through a vacuum, right? There's like nothing obstructing it or anything like that. So anything else will have a index, an index of refraction um, that is greater than or equal to one, right? So if you have speed of light, which is three times 78, anything else will have lower speed of light. So like one times 10 to the seventh, which I was talking about earlier, that'll give you an index of refraction that's greater than one, right? So one is the greatest you can, um, or not one is the greatest, one is the least uh, index refraction, index of a refraction. You could have indices of refraction like two or three or whatever, right? Um, index of refraction is always greater than or equal to one. You cannot be less than one. It cannot be like 0.9 or something. Um, but yeah, that brings us to understanding how does light travel through a material. So light travels in, you know, waves like we said before with 131, but um, more specifically, I guess with this context, it travels through material as rays, light rays, right? And rays are these straight lines of light, but they may change direction, right? They might be reflected or refracted. Um, that's kind of from a general sense that we probably know from other science classes, light can be reflected or refracted um, as the light passes from one material to another, right? And so figuring out the direction of the light rays and how they change is based on two laws, the law of reflection and the law of refraction, right? So reflection, reflection, this FL, um, I like to think of it as like flipping the light, right? So it's like for situations in which light bounces off matter. So like if you have like a mirror or something, then the light will bounce off, will be flipped basically. So if you're going like, this might be southeast. Now you're going like, what is that? 
uh, southwest. Yeah. Anyway, um, so you kind of flip it. That's what I like to think of it as. But I think it's probably better for this context and for the future um, problems and stuff that you're going to be doing is just to think of reflection as light bouncing off a material. So it bounces off of it, right? Refraction is when light passes through a material, right? Passes through matter. So refraction, FR, will go through a material. Reflection, FL, will go and bounce off of the material, right? So let's look at specifically, right, what is the law of, refle law of reflection, right? So we mentioned earlier that reflection is essentially when you have a light ray that will bounce off another material or surface, right? So the rays will bounce off of the surface at different angles. So you have a ray coming in. It'll bounce off at different angles depending on the angle that initially hit the surface, right? So it's not always kind of a constant like angle that you come off, come off of from the surface, right? Depending on the angle that you hit the surface with, that's going to give us an indication of what the angle is coming or bouncing off of the surface, right? So if you come in with an angle that's 45 degrees, right, that'll affect and change the angle coming off that bounces off the reflected ray, right? So it's not always, for example, like your reflected ray is not always 45 degrees. It's not always 30 degrees or whatever. It's dependent on the incident ray, right? The ray that comes in, right, and causes this incidence of refraction, or reflection, I mean. So we measure the angles that hit the surface and bounce off of the surface with respect to a line called the normal line, right? And so this normal line here, this dashed line, is a line that's drawn perpendicular to where the light hits, right? So there's the, this is where the light hits. Here's a 90 degree angle. Here's the perpendicular line right there. So we measure the angles of the incident ray and the reflected ray from this normal line, right? And so kind of to reiterate, this incident ray is the ray that hits the surface initially, and the reflected ray is the, is the ray that bounces off of the surface, right? It's the reflected ray. Um, but yeah, and then for the law of reflection, what it specifically states is that the angle of reflection, right, the angle at which the incident ray is coming in at is equal to the angle of, um, my bad, no, hold on, I said that the other way around. The angle of reflection, right, which is the angle that bounces off of the surface, is equal to the angle of incidence, the incident ray, which is the angle that comes in onto the surface, right? So this tells us that the incident ray and the reflected ray should be at the same angle. So if I came in with 45 degrees, the light ray comes here, causes this incidence of refraction, or if, I keep saying refraction, reflection, right? Incidence of reflection, right? This reflected ray will bounce off and will be at the same 45 degree angle, right? That's the idea here of the law of reflection, that your incident ray and your reflected ray will have the same angle measured from the normal line, right? Um, law of refraction now is a little bit more complex, it's slightly different here. Um, and this is probably what you're gonna see a little bit more of on the uh, quiz and on the exam and stuff like that. So we mentioned earlier, right, that refraction is when you have a light ray that will pass through another material, right? From one material or one medium, that's what we call it, one medium or one material to another medium or another material, right? And so when it passes through, it's not just a simple kind of like, let's say here you're going through air and then this other side is water. It doesn't just go like completely through it like that, right? Generally what happens is you have some kind of bending of the light ray. And that's why, for example, probably seen this experiment a million times in maybe in elementary school, maybe in middle school. Um, but if you put a pencil, right, in a, in a cup of water, you don't see that pencil kind of just straight going through the water and that's it, right? If you look at it, it kind of looks like broken in half almost or bent. And that's because of this law of refraction, right? You have one medium, which is air. That's the material that the pencil is initially going through. And then you have this other medium, which is water. And that's the other end of the pencil, right? And then light is passing through from air to water. And so it causes this kind of bended image that you observe, right? So the light rays 
will bend at the surface at different angles depending on the angle at which they hit the surface, right? So if I'm coming in with a specific angle and I hit the water, right, then this is my normal line here, this is my normal, right? So this is my incident ray. Then I could, for example, bend downwards like this, right? That's kind of how you see a pencil would bend in a cup of water, for example, right? Um, it'll bend at a specific angle that's dependent on the initial angle that I had the ray at, right? So if I come in with a specific incident ray angle, that'll cause a specific ref refracted ray angle, basically, right? So we measure the angles, once again, that hit the surface and bounce off of the surface with respect to a line called the normal line, right? So the line that's perpendicular to the surface at the point where the light ray hits, right? So if I have air, water here, here's my incident ray, comes in, here's my normal line, right? That's where the water is supposed to be hitting, or where the light is supposed to be hitting the water, right? And then based on this normal line here, I can calculate this theta, this is theta one, and then let's say this kind of bends downwards like that. Then measured from the normal line, once again, this is theta two, right? So that's the idea, that I'm measuring this incident ray and this refracted ray from the um, normal line, right? That's the most important thing here. Now, the law of refraction is also called Snell's law, and that tells us that the angle that the incident and refracted ray make with respect to the normal line, right? So those two angles that they make are related by the indices of refraction of the two mediums, right? So the ray, the incident ray that comes in and hits the water, right? Or hits this other medium will then bend and cause a refracted ray that will have its own angle, right? And those two angles, right? We can relate them or say that basically like, the reason that the angle changes is based on the differences in the indices of refraction, right? Based on the differences in the materials, right? So water is an entirely different material, you know, different medium than air, right? Different medium than a vacuum. And so based on those differences in the mediums, then it's going to cause that difference in the incident ray angle and the refracted ray angle, right? So once again, the incident ray is the ray that hits the surface initially. Reflected ray is that is the ray that bounces, well, not bounces off. I think I need to edit this part a little bit. Um, it should be the refracted ray. Refracted ray, and that's the ray that will pass through the material. Right? that'll bend, bend through the other medium, right? And so this is the mathematical representation of Snell's law or the law of refraction. It tells us that we can kind of relate these two angles, the incident angle, right? And the refracted angle by relating them to the indices of refraction of the two mediums, right? So the medium one, its index of refraction times sine of the incident angle is equal to the index refraction of the second medium times sine of that angle of the refracted ray, right? So that's the idea of the law of refraction here as well. Any questions so far about law of refraction or law of reflection? Always feel free to just stop me pause me, ask a question, send something in the chat, or unmute whenever you guys are unsure about anything. All good? Okay, awesome. So now we saw what reflection looked like before, right? We saw that reflection, you had this incident ray bounced off of the surface at exactly the same angle, right? Kind of in this V shape, right? So what does refraction look like? Well, I kind of described it a couple times here and I described it with that example of pencil in the water, right? Basically what you see is that this incident angle will come in 
right? This incident, incident ray will come in at a specific angle. And then you might have that ray being bent a little bit, right? Um, in a different direction, right? Um, you could also have the ray coming up through the water, for example, in this case, and then getting bent a little bit like that um, in the air, right? Now, I'll come back to this kind of image or at least this concept here in a second because there's something important here with respect to the description that they have. Um, but I'll go over that in a second here. So I just wanted to kind of reiterate some things about Snell's Law. Once again, N1 is the index of refraction for the first material. N2 is the index of refraction of the second material. Theta1 is the angle between the incident light ray going through material 1 and the normal line. And then theta two is the angle between the refracted light ray going through material two and the normal line, right? So this theta two is the angle between the normal line and the refract, well, hold up. I think they got this the other way around in the reading. Um, technically this, if you're going from this medium to this one, right? Then this would be your reflect, your refracted, not refracted, refracted ray this would be your refracted ray here and so in this case like theta one would be your refracted angle but one and two doesn't matter like it's just one and two is just referring to like which medium you're going through first or second right so technically like if we're going you can see the direction of the arrows like if we're going from air to water then this is one and this is two right if we're going from uh, water to air, then this would technically be one, this would be, be two, right? So that's the idea there, that you label the angles based on um, which one, like which material you're traveling through first, right? So you could also just say like this is the um, incident angle and this is the refracted angle basically, like I said. But I was mentioning earlier about that description, the little a caption underneath that um, picture. What's important to know about how a refracted angle is drawn going between different mediums, right? There's really important key idea to understand here. Um, and that's that the refracted angle will bend toward the normal line or away, right? It can bend toward the normal line or away from the normal line, right? It just depends on which direction you're moving in, right? Are you moving from a lower index of refraction to a higher index of refraction? Or are you moving from high to low, right? That's the idea here. It depends on whether you're moving from a high index of refraction to a low index of refraction or from a lower index of refraction to a higher index of refraction. That will determine whether you bend toward the normal line or you bend away from the normal line, right? And what do I, what do I mean or, or, or how do we see or understand um, whether an angle or whether, a, or whether a ray will bend towards the normal line or not, right? So the idea is that we have this ray, this incident ray. If we just allowed it to keep going, right? If it were, if it didn't have another medium that it's encountering, like if, it was, if this was just straight up air the entire way through, then this line would continue like that, right? And then here's our normal line. So, when we say that it bends towards the normal line, that means that your incident ray will be bent in a way that it gets obviously closer to the normal line, right? So you can see here, this is what normally it would be if we didn't have a second medium. And then because of that second medium, it kind of bends towards the normal line, right? Bends downwards like that towards the normal line. It's not a matter of downwards or upwards. It's just more, like I said, just like you draw the incident angle as if it were continuing on without any other medium that it encounters. And then obviously take into account that, well, okay, if this is my like original incident ray, as if there were no other mediums, then this refracted ray is moving towards the normal line. So it bends towards it. On the other hand, here I can see that, okay, well, here's my incident ray. I can kind of extend it draw it like this and I'm like all right well if this was just pure water right then the ray would kind of continue like that but now you see that this refracted ray is kind of this way right 
So is this bend, bending toward or away from the normal line? Toward or away from the normal line? Considering that the normal line is right here. Way exactly right. So here's my normal line. Here's what my ray would have been had there been no other medium. And now here's where it's at because of that second medium. So it moved away. Right? This moved towards, this moved away, right? Because you're getting closer to the normal line here. You're making that angle smaller essentially. And then here you're making that angle bigger. You're getting away from the normal line. Right? So whether you move away or toward the normal line, once again, is dependent on if you're moving from low to high index of refraction or high to low index of refraction. So if you're moving low to high, from low index of refraction to high index of refraction, light will bend toward the normal line. If you're moving from high to low, your light will bend away from the normal line. So, Here, if we looked at, there's a, believe, there's a table, I believe, in the reading that tells you all of the indices of refraction. You don't need to know it, but you just need to know like some things like, um, obviously, air or the vacuum would be index of refraction of 1, right? So we know that light will bend toward the normal line if you're going from low to high, right? So here, the light bends towards the normal line, right? So we're going from a what? A low to high index of refraction, right? So, oops. So this is a lower index of refraction compared to water, right? This is a higher index of refraction. So you're going low to high, it bends towards the normal line. But then you have here where you're going from high to low, right? So you're going from water to air is high to low, it'll essentially bend away from the normal line, right? So high to low bends away from the normal line, low to high will bend towards the normal line. Does that make sense so far? And yeah, Thomas, if you need to go, no worries. Okay, sounds good. Now that brings us to um, some other important concepts with respect to reflection, refraction, some more like niche type concepts here. Um, and that is, what is total internal reflection, right? So total internal reflection is kind of a very unique case um, like that kind of exhausts normal refraction, if you will, so, right? So like, we have to keep in mind that the maximum angle of refraction is 90 degrees. What does that mean, right? So once again, we said that a refracted angle, we can measure that angle relative to the normal line. So we have a normal line like this, right? And let's say here's like water and here's air, right? So we have an angle that's going like that. That's our incident uh, ray or incident angle, right? Let's say here's the angle between the normal line and the incident ray then a refracted ray can have a maximum angle of 90 degrees, which is literally just like here, here, the angle between the refracted ray and the normal line. And so we can see here that's 90 degrees. So that looks like it's just barely like entering the second medium, right? It's barely entering air. You're going from water to air. It's barely going through the air. It's kind of like just along the surface or just along the interface between the two mediums, right? So that's when you observe your maximum angle of refraction is at 90 degrees, right? That's your maximum angle of refraction. That's of the refracted ray. That's of the refracted ray here. We're not talking about this angle, like the incident ray being 90 degrees. We're talking about the refracted angle being 90 degrees as the maximum angle of refraction, right? So there is a specific, like what I like to call like a threshold angle, right? Um, 
And this threshold angle is basically like the maximum angle that would cause this maximum angle of refraction, right? So it's like the maximum angle of the incident ray to cause the maximum angle of the refraction ray, right? Or the ref ref refracted ray. So um, this threshold angle is called the critical angle, right? And at this critical angle, like at that specific angle, right? You haven't passed that angle. You haven't gone past it, right? Let's say the critical angle is like 67 degrees or something, right? So at like 67 degrees itself, at specifically 67 degrees, um, you will have that maximum angle of refraction, 90 degrees, right? Anything greater than that critical angle, like 67 and a half, 68 degrees, 70 degrees, it'll cause this specific case called total internal reflection, which just means that no light is refracted at all. The light actually doesn't even pass through the second medium. And then all light is completely reflected. So like I said, at the critical angle, at that 67 degrees, for example, the refracted ray is 90 degrees, right? So if I came in with 67 degrees, that's the critical angle causing this maximum angle of refraction of 90 degrees. If I go 67.1, 67.5, 68, for example, right? It's gonna cause total internal reflection, right? Um, and so, like I said, it's just, means that the ray is not refracted at all and it doesn't pass through the other material. The ray just bounces off, right? So let's say at that 68 degrees then, instead of it, you know, passing through material and then like bending, for example, or something like that, oops, bent, oops, man. All right, like bending this way or that way or whatever, right? Instead of bending, what it'll do is just completely reflect, completely reflect off. Right? That's the idea of total internal reflection. It's looking at the critical angle. And that's kind of like your threshold angle, like I said. That's where you're experiencing two things at that threshold. Number one, at that specific angle, at that critical angle, at that threshold angle, at that angle, you're going to be experiencing your maximum angle of refraction. Anything past that, anything past that threshold, you're going to be experiencing the second situation, which is total internal reflection, right? That's when light no longer bends, it no longer passes through the second medium, and it will now just com get completely bounced off or reflected, right? So you might be asking or wondering, how do we determine the critical angle, right? How do we determine this critical angle, this threshold angle at which we experience at it the maximum angle of refraction? and anything past it we experience total internal reflection so we use this angle or this equation right here right theta c that's our critical angle that's equal to the inverse sine of the ratio of the second medium to the first medium right and this is basically like your incident and if it were you're refracted right so it's like the medium you're passing through for your incident ray and then the second medium that you would have passed through um, for your refracted ray, right? So if we had, let's say for example, um, yeah, water is like 1.5, for example, I don't know, I'm just making it up. One, well, water is 1.5 for its um, index of refraction and air is one, right? So this is N1 and this is N2, right? because this is what you're going through first and this is what you're going through second. That's if you were going to be refracting, right? And so at this point, you plug in N2 over N1, right? Whatever your second medium was gonna be divided by your first medium. Um, and then if you take the inverse sine of that ratio, that'll give you your critical angle, right? Now, Technically, there is one exception to this rule and this idea of a critical angle, and that is critical angles will only apply if the light travels from a high index material into a low index material, 
right? You will never experience total internal reflection if you're going from uh, low to high. It's always high to low is where you experience total internal reflection, right? So I can't experience total internal reflection here, for example. Like I can't just be like, oh, here's my critical angle and I do like that. Can't do that. I can do it for this one though, right? Through the water where I'm passing from high index of refraction to low index of refraction, right? It can get re re reflected like that. So that's the idea there. That's kind of one of the exceptions there for the critical angle stuff. Does that make sense so far for like understanding basic principles about light? Okay, cool. Any questions at all? Any concerns? No? Okay, cool. Now we get into geometric optics and that's pretty much going to be like the bulk of this chapter um, and what's gonna be really, really important for this next chapter as well. Um, this idea of ray tracing and drawing your rays and figuring out where an image is located that's formed. But before we talk about all that, we have to address what is an image from the beginning, right? So an image, this might be really stupid to kind of define, right? But an image is a visual representation of something that our brain, is, brain insists is there but it's at a different location than the original object that the light rays came from, right? So my interpretation of this, and I'm not sure if I'm 100% correct on this, but basically in real life, the idea is that you see an object in front of you, right? So I'm looking at my iPad, for example, right now, and I see my iPad in front of me, I'm able to visualize it, I'm able to create this image, like I see the iPad in front of me, but the image formed on my retina, right? is not where the object is actually located. So if you know a little bit about your anatomy and stuff, right, you'll obviously have an image that's projected onto your retina, right? So the location of the image is on your retina, but the actual object is not located in your retina, right? It's located in front of you on the table, right? So my iPad is not located in my retina. It's not inside my eyeball. I perceive it, my brain perceives it as inside my eyeball, right? The image is projected there, but the actual location of the object is going to be in front of me on the table, right? So we're not going to be looking into how, like, at least in depth, we're not going to go really in depth on looking like the anatomy of the eye and figuring out how the eye will factor into all of this. I believe towards the end of this like unit, we're gonna be looking a little bit more about like specific eye conditions like hyperopia and myopia, right? Um, but with myopia and hyperopia, like those are just gonna be specific conditions that you're gonna be able to figure out um, where an image is going to be formed or how to correct um, those conditions using lenses and stuff, which is gonna be for the next chapter. But like I said, um, the image is just kind of like a perceived, you know, uh, visual representation of an actual object, basically. That's kind of the gist that you need to understand, right? So we might be asking ourselves, well, what images could be formed by reflection, right? You, you often like hear about reflection and refraction causing like different images of objects, right? You might have experimented with this um, in other science classes, but for reflection, the images of real objects, right, are produced from reflected light rays, right? So the images formed by reflection are images of real objects that are produced from ref reflected light rays. I cannot say reflected and refracted for the life of me today. Um, so yeah, images formed by reflection, right? These are images of real objects produced from reflected light light rays, right? So once again, we said that reflected light rays are light rays that will bounce off of a material, right? So the images that are produced are as a result of those light rays that have bounced off, right? So here's a specific example of images and flat plane mirrors, right? 
So when you look at yourself in a mirror, it kind of seems that the image of yourself is kind of behind the mirror, right? So light rays coming off of a real object, light rays that come off of a real object might bounce off of a mirror. They get reflected into our eyes and then we perceive that object at a different location than where it actually is, right? So here, for example, light ray comes off of my head, bounces off, it gets reflected off of the mirror, gets projected onto my eye, right? And now I perceive that, like if I extended this reflected ray, I perceive that the image, right? I perceive that this image is actually coming from behind the mirror, which is kind of odd, right? And same thing for my feet here. My feet, light rays will bounce off of my feet, hit the mirror, get reflected, <laughs> reflected, reflected, and then get projected onto my eye. And then if I kind of extend in the other direction here, this reflected ray, I can see that my eyes kind of perceive the image of my feet to be behind the mirror, right? So those reflected rays will cause us to perceive an image and perceive that object at a different location than where it actually is, right? So I know that I'm in, I'm in front of the mirror, but I perceive myself as behind it when I look at the mirror, right? Now, to form kind of an image like that, right, you need like a million different like light rays, right, that will bounce off like every single point of your body, for example, or bounce off every single point of this medicine bottle, right? Um, and when all of those rays are kind of combined together, right, when they're compiled, um, and then they're reflected off of the mirror and they project onto our eyes, that point we'd be able to obtain an image of the object, right? And that's behind the mirror in this case, right? So if we were to take, for example, every single point, draw a, a light ray bouncing off or coming off of this um, medicine bottle, right? And then reflect it, we combine all these different points onto our eye, we're able to see this fully formed image of the medicine bottle behind the flat mirror, right? Or we, we're at least able to perceive it or think that it's located behind the, the flat mirror, right? So it's kind of compiling all these different light rays that are reflected off of the different points of an object, right? Look at how they're uh, reflected off a mirror, projected onto our eyes, and then that helps us to produce this uh, perceived image, right? Now the idea is that the light rays do not actually come from the image, they seem to originate from the image, right? So if I were to look at all these different combined like rays here, right? That everything just kind of bounces off of the mirror like that. But the idea is that if I, like I said, like I did before here, if I extended all of these rays, right? They seem to originate from, it's as if light rays were being sent from the image onto our eyes, right? So they seem to originate from the image and then get projected onto our eyes, but that's not the case, right? So no light rays actually come from the image. It's just that they seem to originate from the image, right? We can extend reflected light rays behind the mirror to find a specific point of the image produced or perceived, right? So if I just want to look at, for example, like the lid of the medicine bottle, then I'm looking at these rays here, right? So I had, this is the bottle, light bounced off of it, got reflected off of the mirror, right? Let's say these two points represent, or these two rays represent the lid or the cap of the bottle. If I extended, if I did like a dashed line of these reflected rays, then I can see that they kind of form this lid here behind the flat mirror and it almost seems as if the um, the rays that are projected onto my eye are originating from that image, when in reality they're not, right? Just things being bounced off other things, right? Light rays being bounced off of the um, medicine bottle get bounced off of the mirror, and then if I extended 
with a dashed line like this, the reflected ray, then I can see that it seems that the reflected ray is originating from this image behind the mirror, right? When in reality, it's not. But yeah, now there's some important terminology that you should know and understand for not just like flat plane mirrors, but also for curved mirrors and other situations. Um, and that is image is a perceived object, right? An object is the actual real object, right? Upright image refers to an image that has the same vertical orientation as the true object. An inverted image is if the image has a flipped vertical orientation, right? So let's say, for example, if I'm looking at a tree, right? That's not really a tree. I don't know why. I guess I should kind of, I don't know. Let's see here. Here's another tree like that. Here's a tree. That's the real object. That's the real tree. That's my upright image. If it was an inverted image, then it would look like this. Simply flipped upside down, right? Object distance, that's labeled D sub O, is the distance from the object to the mirror. Image distance is D sub I, and that's the distance from the mirror um, to the image, right? Or from the image to the mirror, either way. Virtual image is when um, the light rays that we do see do not actually come off from the location of the image, right? And so that just means that the light rays um, only seem to originate from the image, right? So if it's a virtual image, then the light rays seem to originate from the image, but they do not actually converge at the image location, right? A real image will have the light rays actually intersect or converge at the location of the image, right? And there's no like, um, this, there's no idea of the um, origin of the rays or anything like that. We can just see for a real image that the image has all the light rays converging at that point. A virtual image only kind of, it only seems like the light rays are originating from the image, coming from the image basically. Right, magnification is just a comparison of relative size of images to objects. Right, so you can have a larger image or a smaller image relative to the object, and we'll get into how to calculate and understand all these different terms here in a second. But for a flat plane mirror, if we were to look at what this image is, right, and describe it using the terminology that we have, we realize that it's a virtual image first of all, right, because the light rays do not actually converge here, right? They don't, they don't actually like come and connect here because they're bounced off of the mirror, right? They don't go through the mirror. Um, so the light rays do not converge. They seem to originate from the mirror or from the object. So it's a virtual image. Um, they seem to originate from the image, my bad. They seem to originate from the image. So it's a virtual image. Um, it's upright because it's in the same kind of vertical orientation. It's not flipped as the object, right? And it's not magnified, right? So it's not larger or smaller. It's the exact same size, right? So images produced by a flat plane mirror will always be virtual, upright, and not magnified. That's the idea there. But how do we figure out how like far away the distance of the object is or the distance of the image is? Well, the object distance for a flat plane mirror is equal to the image distance in magnitude, right? Um, they'll be located the same distance away from the mirror's location, right? So here's the kind of the center of the mirror there. There's the location of the mirror. This is DO, distance of object. This is DI, distance of image, and they'll be the same. Same distance away in magnitude, right? But one object, right, the actual real object, is located in front of the mirror and the image that's produced seems to originate from behind the mirror like we said right so we want to kind of differentiate those two distances right we can't just have them be equal to each other so the way that we differentiate them is that um, the object location the object distance is equal to the negative of the image distance right so that just basically means that your image distance is negative and your object distance is positive right and that's not like you can see here like some people might think that oh it's positive and negative like x-axis no just because this is along the 
positive x-axis does not mean that the image distance is positive, right? Whether your image distance or your object distance is positive or negative is dependent on if you have a virtual or real image, right? So object distance is always positive. Object distance is always positive. The real object is always at a positive distance away from the mirror. And then the virtual or then the image distance, right, is based on if the, ob or if, if the image is virtual or real, right? So virtual images will always have a negative image distance and real images have a positive uh, image distance, right? So in this case for plain mirrors, it's always going to be a negative image distance. Why? Because the image that's always produced is virtual images. So, yeah. Does that make sense so far? Okay. So that was flat plane mirrors. Now we kind of get into curved mirrors, which is like the bulk of what's going on here with this chapter and um, a little bit more of the difficult stuff here. So there's two types of curved mirrors. You, mirrors, you either have convex or concave mirrors, right? So um, for convex and concave, a convex mirror or convex surface is the reflecting surface looks like the outer side of a sphere where the mirror is curving toward the object, right? So here's the object, right? Then a convex mirror would be kind of curving towards the object, right? And it's the, if this were a sphere, then it's the outer edge of the sphere, right? That's your convex mirror. Concave mirrors, right? The reflecting surface looks like the inner side of a sphere and the mirror is kind of curving away from the object, right? So if here's your object, it kind of curves away, kind of away from the object, right? And if we were to kind of like look on the inside of a sphere, instead of, so this is the outside, here's the inside. The inside is concave. In cave, you can kind of think about like cave, like cavity, right? Like a, an abyss, like a hole, or even just like a cave. You're looking inside a cave, for example, right? Um, that's how I like to think of it as well. So looking inside a cavity or a cave, it's kind of this open abyss, right? But for convex, it's kind of curving towards you. Convex is tur turning court. Tur Gosh, I cannot speak today. Curving towards you and concave is turning or curving away from you. Um, for mirrors, right? And there's also some additional terminology that we should understand for curved mirrors and these are the following, right? So you have optical axis. So optical axis is the axis of symmetry that passes through the mirror's center of curvature and the mirror's vertex, right? So the optical axis is basically just like kind of splitting the mirror in half, right? So here's the optical axis, kind of sp splits the curved mirror in half here, right? And it splits it, and, or the, the optical axis kind of goes through the vertex of the mirror which is kind of like the midpoint of the curved mirror, right? So the midpoint where it kind of cuts everything in half, it's called the vertex and the optical axis goes straight through that middle of that vertex right there, right? And then we have focal point. Uh, focal point is the point midway between the vertex of the curved mirror and the center of curvature, right? So we're looking at center of curvature. This is the, basically like the center of the circle essentially, right? The focal point should be found like right here, right in the middle between the vertex and the center of curvature, right? That's your focal point, and that's denoted with a lowercase f. Or, uh, my bad, focal, focal point or focal length should be both um, like f, lowercase f. I think usually though like focal point is like capital F just to indicate that that's the point itself, and then focal length is the actual like length between um, the mirror's vertex of the focal point, right? So here's your capital F, that's your focal point, and then from vertex to focal point, that's your focal length. Sound good so far with this terminology? Because um, the last thing here is the radius of curvature, and radius of curvature, right, is just a measurement of how curved the mirror is it's kind of indicative of the radius of the imaginary sphere, 
right? So we only ever get to see just the mirror like this. We don't get to see the rest of this circle here, the rest of the sphere. So the radius of curvature, is just kind of like the measurement um, of like from the center of the sphere, right? Or center of the circle to the vertex, right? That's your radius. The radius is measured from the center of curvature to the vertex of the um, curved mirror or to the sphere, right? It's a measurement of how curved the mirror is. Um, there's some other important things that you should know about convex and concave mirrors as well, and that is um, light rays coming toward a concave mirror will get reflected and then they'll converge in front of the mirror with some of those rays going through or converging at the focal points, right? I think I had an image for this. I'm not sure if I had it here, if I forgot to include it. I might have forgotten to include it. Um, I believe it's in the reading. Let me pull up exactly what page it is. Uh, one sec. Let's see here. It's page 22. So if you have this concave mirror like this, right? You have all these different rays, right? They'll get reflected and they'll converge maybe at the focal point at F, at point F, right? They'll come together, they'll intersect at point F. Um, but not all of them do, not always, right? Um, and at the same time, like, what was I going to say? You might not always have the image kind of formed on the same side of the um, focal length here for a concave mirror. So concave mirror, once again, you have your focal length here to the left of the mirror. And you have your center of curvature here as well. Because think about it, like if we were to draw this sphere like this, center of curvature makes sense that it would be on this side as well as the focal length, right? Um, but yeah, I mean, we'll get into this later because it's a little bit more complex, but based on where your object's at relative to the center of curvature and the focal length, um, the idea of the light rays getting reflected and then converging on the um, focal point or in front of the mirror might not always be the case, right? So in that image that they have on page 22, they have the um, the light rays kind of getting reflected and they kind of all kind of converge at this point F here, right? So when you have converging light rays like that, when they when the light rays, the reflected light rays converge on an actual point like this, then you have an, an, a real image that's produced. I mean, that's what we said earlier. You have a real image that's produced. Now, that doesn't always happen. Based on where the object is located, like here, the way they drew it in on page 22, they're assuming that the object is like here, right? So the light rays coming off of it um, at that position might converge in that way. However, if we had an object that was like in front of the focal length like that, or maybe in between the center of curvature and the focal length like this, it might cause the light rays to be reflected and converge at a slightly different point, right? They might not all get converged on the focal point. Um, or, and we'll get into this in a sec here, they might not even like actually converge at a specific point in front of the mirror. They might actually seem to originate, the, the reflected rays might actually seem to originate behind the mirror in some cases, just depending on the situation. So we'll get, get into that in a sec. But light rays coming towards a convex mirror will also get reflected, right? So this is convex, they'll get reflected. 
Um, they'll bounce off. And the light rays will not really converge. They won't come together. They won't intersect at a specific point. But they seemingly kind of originate at a specific point behind the uh, mirror, right? So there's a question here. Uh, so the reason convex mirrors produce only virtual images is because of how the rays don't converge. Yeah, right? So for convex mirrors, because the rays don't converge, right, they diverge, um, they produce virtual images because the rays seem to originate from behind the mirror, right? And so by converging, like, I mean, they kind of like intersect at a specific point. Like they all kind of, um, with a, with a concave mirror, right? Like this, they all kind of, um, come together at a specific point, right? They all kind of intersect at a specific point. But if you have a convex mirror, everything will kind of bounce off like this or whatever. They won't like intersect at a specific point at a common point. And so everything will seemingly converge or seemingly originate from behind the mirror. So like in a way, convex mirrors have converging light rays, but not really. It's more like they seem to originate or they seem to converge behind the mirror. That's the idea for convex mirrors. Um, but also like center of curvature for a concave mirror, right? Center of curvature will be uh, located on the same side of the object or to the left if we're looking from left to the right. So C, this is your F. Like I, like I said, if you have, if you can continue this like imaginary sphere or imaginary circle, that's where your center of curvature should be. That's where your focal length should be because that's kind of like inside the circle, right? Because we said that the concave mirrors are kind of like the inside, the cavity, the cave inside the sphere. So center of curvature should be to the left of that if you're looking at things from left to right. Um, and it should be on the same side of the object. Now, if you have a convex mirror like this, right, then um, your center of curvature is actually here and your focal length is there as well, right? So we know that for uh, convex mirrors, like you said, the virtual image is always produced. Right? A virtual image is always produced. And that means that your image that's produced seemingly kind of originates um, somewhere behind the mirror, right? So if that is the case, then like we said earlier, some of these light rays will seem to originate or converge, seemingly originate or seemingly converge behind the mirror, right? So they might go through the focal point for some of them, um, or at least they're just kind of converging at this specific point or seeming to originate at this specific point behind the mirror, right? So if that happens, it has to happen like maybe at the focal length, um, near the focal length, somewhere like relative to those points, right? So um, the center of curvature and the focal length or the focal point, my bad, will be located on the same side of that virtual image, right? So they'll be located behind the mirror essentially. So your focal point and your center of curvature will be located behind the mirror. Because once again, if we kind of continue this imaginary circle, this is our convex side, right? Here's our focal point, here's our center of curvature. They should be kind of inside the circle, right? So this would be your convex, right? And if we did your concave, right? Then here's your focal point and here's your center of curvature. And if we draw that, if we, if we drew that, um, imaginary sphere, we should see the center there in the middle again and the focal point right there like that. Does that make sense so far on how to kind of like visualize these convex versus concave? And then this idea of converging and diverging rays. Okay, any questions you sure you want to confirm anything or We'll get into that here in a second. Um, but yeah, and then there's this 
we mentioned focal length earlier, right? So we want to relate it to the radius of curvature. And remember, like the radius would just be distance from the center to any like side of the circle, right? So this radius of curvature is related to the focal length by this equation, where focal length is equal to the radius of curvature divided by two, right? So this tells us then, right, that if focal length is equal to radius of curvature divided by two, then the radius of curvature is equal to two times the focal length, right? And if the radius of curvature is measured from the center point, right, from the, from the center of curvature, from the center of the sphere, from the center of the circle, then that means the focal length or the um, focal point, basically, is going to be located um, right in the middle between the center of curvature and the vertex. Right, so we said the vertex here was like the edge um, or like the midpoint of the curve of the mirror, right? So this is your focal length from vertex to focal point, right? That's your F, your lowercase f, right? And if we multiply that distance by two, two times the focal length, right? Here's another focal length. Then that gets us to the center, right? That gives us our radius of curvature here, which is from the vertex to the center of the sphere or center of curvature here, right? So you can figure out your focal length by taking the radius of curvature divided by two. Um, but then there's a lot of examples and a lot of ways we can figure out um, where an image is located, if it's upright, if it's inverted, if it's virtual, if it's real, etc. right? And the way that we can do that is by using a technique called ray tracing. And so that's, as the name suggests, we just draw a bunch of these light rays and figure out how they get reflected, right? Um, how they'll bounce off, how they'll converge, how they'll diverge, and then where do these light rays converge, where do they seemingly originate, for example, right? Um, and that helps us figure out what kind of image is formed. If it's a bigger image than the object, if it's a inverted image, right? Um, if it's virtual, if it's real, stuff like that, right? So there are four principal light rays, we call them, that you can draw, but usually only just need two to kind of confirm the image's location and the characteristics. So we draw these light rays in a way to see how they'll be reflected and then see where they converge or seemingly originate from, and that'll tell us where the image is formed um, and give us more information about the image, right? So this is taken straight from the book, pretty much, right? Um, there's those four principal rays, like I said, and I can just kind of go through one by one and I have like a summary of what they should be here and kind of like interesting ways to kind of remember them here. But if we kind of go through this one by one, right, principal ray one, we start from point Q here, right? So this is the object, here's like the height of the object. We start from point Q and the light ray will travel parallel to the optical axis, right? So this is the optical axis right here. We go parallel to the optical axis. Um, and the ray must go through the focal point F of the concave mirror, right? Or appear to come from the focal point of the convex mirror. So it's kind of complex here. And I think perhaps it is better to just use my definitions of things because I think it's just probably easier than looking all this stuff here. This is more formal and it's, I think it's maybe better to visualize with this specific example. Um, but yeah, let me kind of describe it my way. So I call Ray 1 Back to the Future, right? I like to, I don't know, for some reason I came up with this, like with movie titles and stuff. I don't know why, but um, I call Ray 1 Back to the Future, right? Um, and that's kind of like alluding to the idea that you go back to the focal point, right? So you go to the mirror and you go back to the focal point, right? So F is your focal point, back to the future. Right, go to the mirror and you get back to the focal point. So you essentially go from the top of your object directly across to the mirror, parallel to that optical axis. Then you bounce off that ray, you reflect it from the mirror, right? And then have it intersect perfectly through the focal point in front of a concave mirror, right? So here's a concave mirror, 
we draw it perfectly parallel to the optical axis, right? Directly across where it hits the mirror. And then we get back to the future. We get back to the focal point, right? We reflect it, we bounce it completely off and have it perfectly intersect, go right through that focal point F, right? So, oops, that was not what I intended to do here, right here, right? So it goes right through that focal point F. So that's ray one for concave mirrors, right? Back to the future, back to the focal point. For convex mirrors, you still go from the top of the object straight across parallel to the optical axis and then bounce it off, right? And you bounce it off, like you can kind of draw initially like a small little bounced off angle or bounced off ray like this first. And then what you need to do after that is you have to have it seemingly originate from the focal point behind the convex mirror, right? So then you can kind of like draw this imaginary dashed line that basically tells us, okay, well, this reflected angle or this reflected ray seemingly originates directly intersecting from this focal point, right? So it seemingly originates from this focal point, right? So for a convex mirror, since everything seemingly originates from behind the mirror, right? You don't, you always have a virtual image. You don't have a real image, right? They don't converge, they diverge. So you draw this back to the future ray, bounce it off, and then you want to draw it at a specific angle, right? You don't want to draw it like this or like this or anything like that, right? You want to draw it in a, in a way that it's perfectly aligned with and it intersects with, it seemingly originates from the focal point, right? You can draw a dashed line to kind of portray this. So this is ray one and I call that back to the future, right? Does that make sense so far for that first ray? Okay. Ray two, I call it slide to the left, right? So you go through the focal point and you slide to the left, right? You go through the focal point and you slide to the left. So for this, if you have a concave mirror, right? You draw your line from the top of your object, right? And then you go through the focal point until you hit the mirror. So you intersect perfectly with the focal point and then continue until you hit the mirror and then you slide to the left, right? And then the idea with any of these rays, whether a convex or a concave mirror, is that whatever the reflected ray is, at least for a concave mirror, right? Like, so if we're looking for a concave mirror first, whatever the reflected ray is going to be, like somewhere along that line, that reflected line, somewhere along, maybe here, maybe there, maybe over there, right? Is where you have your images located at, right? The idea is that we need to draw more than one of these principal rays to figure out where they kind of intersect at, right? So if I draw this blue one and I draw this red one, okay, they intersect here, right? So that's where my image is located at. The idea is that your reflected rays, the reflected rays, they should all kind of intersect at this image point, right? They should intersect at the top of the image basically, right? So that's the idea there. Um, that's for, for concave mirror, or if you have for concave mirrors, for convex mirrors, none of these really converge. Like this one's going off in its own direction. This one's going off this back direction. This one's sliding to the left on its own. This one's going this way, right? They diverge. They do not converge. They do not connect, converge, connect. They do not come together, right? They seemingly originate from behind the mirror. So it's almost like they converge. They almost converge. They connect behind the mirror, right? They do not actually converge there. That's not where they actually converge. It just, it seems like it. It seems that everything originates from that image point right there. So when you're drawing these dashed lines, and you should always draw these dashed lines to visualize where the light rays seemingly co seemingly converge or seemingly originate from, when you're drawing these dashed lines, wherever they intersect is where your image is located at. Um, but yeah, for, for a convex mirror now, 
for that slide to the left ray, that's ray number two, you once again, you draw it from the top of the object all the way until you hit the mirror. Because remember your focal length, remember this, um, for a concave mirror, we want it to go through the focal point, then hit the mirror, then slide to the left, right? But for this one, we know the focal point for a convex mirror is to the right of the convex mirror. It's behind the mirror, right? right? And the reason why is because, like I said, if we draw this imaginary circle, here's the center of curvature. That's not really the center, but you know, you get the idea is that you're supposed to have the center of curvature like be interior to the, to the um, sphere basically, right? So a convex mirror can be thought of as the exterior of the sphere, because if we continue that sphere, here's the center of curvature in the interior, right? But a concave mirror is kind of like already looking in, in the interior. It's kind of like you're looking in the cavity or in the cave. So if we were to complete this, then we see that the center of curvature is in the interior and it's, and it's on the left, right? It wouldn't make sense, like if we draw this sphere, right? It wouldn't make sense to have the center of curvature over there, right? Because that's outside the circle. So it needs to be inside the circle. And that's why it's on the left here for a concave mirror. And that's why it's on the right here for a convex mirror, right? So center of curvature is in front of the mirror for a concave mirror. And center of curvature is behind the mirror for a convex mirror, right? Um, so for this slide to the left ray, you don't have your focal point here. You have it behind the mirror. So you kind of draw until you hit the mirror and then you slide to the left, right? But once again, we're trying to intersect with the focal point because that's what we did for the concave mirror, right? We went from the top of the object to the focal point and then slide to the left. But before we even get to the focal point, we encounter the mirror. So in real life, what happens is once you encounter the mirror, you slide to the left. But we can pretend, we can imagine that the ray would kind of go through and continue, right? We want this ray to be drawn, this incident ray, to be drawn in a way that it's as if it was going to intersect perfectly with the focal point, right? So we don't want the ray to like be drawn like down here, for example, or like this at this angle. We want the slide to the left ray to be drawn in a way that as if this were going to pass through the convex mirror and go through and perfectly intersect with the focal point on the other side. In reality, like we said, it doesn't go through, it'll bounce off, right? And the rays won't converge anywhere over here. The rays will not converge anywhere over here. They'll seemingly converge or originate on the right, causing a virtual image, right? So this incident ray, we want it to be drawn till it hits the mirror for a convex mirror and then slide to the left. And then we could, we draw that incident ray from the beginning, right? We don't want to draw it like this or like this or anything like that. Like I said, we want to draw it in a way that we get this dashed line that goes through perfectly with the focal point, right? This should be dashed lines. We should not draw solid lines for this one, it should be dashed. And then um, once we have an idea of like how we're supposed to draw this incident ray, right? Which angle we're supposed to draw it at relative to this focal point that it's supposed to be intersecting with, then we can kind of go back and draw this reflected ray which is sliding to the left, basically. Now, whatever slide to the left you just did, right? Whatever reflected ray that you got, once again, if we draw dashed lines from it to the right, we can see wherever it intersects with other rays is where the image is going to be located at, right? So the this slide to the left ray seemingly originates from the right here, right? And the same thing with the back to the future ray. When we reflected it off, when it bounced off, it diverges, it does not connect with any other rays over here, but it seemingly originates. We can draw this dashed line towards the focal point, right? So that's the idea there. Um, so, yeah, for the slide to the left ray, you go from the top of the object 
then you draw a dashed line going through the mirror, pretending that the light ray originates from there, intersect it perfectly with the focal point, and then wherever the solid line touched the mirror, bounce the light ray that goes straight, bounce off a light ray that goes straight horizontally away from the mirror, right? So like I said, you draw this in a way that it's supposed to hit the mirror, then start drawing a dashed line that goes perfectly through that focal point, and then go back and be like, all right, well, here's where it hit the mirror. Now I just slide to the left. That's the idea for the slide to the left ray. Now, the third ray, I like to call it journey to the center of the earth. So this third ray is, is just essentially going right through the center of curvature, right through the center of the earth, right? So for a concave mirror, this third ray should go from the top of the object all the way through the center of curvature and then just continue through until it hits the mirror and then it gets perfectly reflected back, not like this, not like that, just along that same ray. And then wherever it kind of goes back like this, wherever it intersects with other rays is where the image is formed for a concave mirror. Similarly, for a convex mirror, you draw it from the top of the object like that, draw it, draw it, draw it. Oh, well, I hit the, I hit the uh, mirror here. So now I can just pretend that, okay, well, what if I just continued, right? Then I can start drawing dashed lines until I hit that radi or that center of curvature, right? Where I perfectly intersect with it. That's like somewhere along this, this point, somewhere along this dashed line, wherever it intersects with other dashed lines, wherever it intersects with other, or seemingly intersects with other rays, reflected rays, that's where my image is gonna be located at, right? And so now I can just go back to my mirror where, where, where the incident ray interacted with the mirror, and I, I know that it'll just be bounced off in the exact same or opposite direction, right? So it's just gonna be like this and then bounce off the other way. But I have to draw this dashed line to show that, okay, well, this reflected ray, the one that's supposed to be going this way, seemingly originates behind the mirror and it's gonna intersect with other rays and wherever they intersect or, or seemingly converge or seemingly originate, that's where my image is gonna be located at, right? So that's your journey to the center of the earth ray. And then finally, V for vendetta. So you go to the vertex, V for vendetta. So for V for vendetta, you start off at your object and you go to the V, to the vertex, right? So you draw one big ray like this until you hit the vertex, which is the exact middle of the um, mirror. And then you bounce it off in a perfect V shape, right? So here's your optical axis. You go and draw your line all the way down to the vertex and then you kind of reflect it in a way that has a perfect v-shape that kind of splits the v right in the middle that you can see here um, by the optical axis so wherever that reflected ray intersects with other rays other reflected rays that's where your image is formed for a concave mirror for a convex mirror once again v for vendetta you start from your object height here from the top you go down right until you hit the vertex and then you bounce off in a perfect V-shape that's split by the optical axis. Now, wherever it bounced off, right, wherever this reflected ray is bouncing off, you draw a dashed line to indicate that it seemingly originates behind the mirror at a specific point. Wherever that seeming, whatever the dashed line seemingly intersects, converge, converges, or originates with other dashed lines from your other rays is where the image is going to be located at. Does that make a little bit more sense um, with all this stuff here? And does it help to kind of, I don't know if it's like any benefit to like remember these by uh, names of movies. Mm -hmm. 
Exactly. No, yeah. The the cotton cave stuff is is much more easy and it's like it's very much more straightforward than the convex stuff. Um, the convex, what's nice about it is that like um, you kind of you're you're like okay, well once it hits the mirror, it just bounces off of everything. Like nice, cool, right? But like you said, you definitely have to remember that you have to draw these dashed lines to figure out where the image is located behind the mirror. But yeah. Um, and then what makes concave actually less intuitive um, when we're trying to figure out like if an object is virtual, real, or anything like that is because it depends on where the object is located. And I'll get to that in a sec here. Because if you have this object behind the center of curvature, center of curvature, center of curvature, I cannot speak today. Um, based on where, where you have your object located, like if you have it behind the center of curvature here or in between the center of curvature and the focal point or at the focal point or in front of the focal point, that'll cause different types of images, different types of magnifications, stuff like that, right? But, but with a diverging um, ray, created by this convex uh, mirror, you're always gonna have the same type of image formed. It's always gonna be virtual, smaller, and upright. Um, but we'll get to get to that here in a second. So you might be asking too like, well, do I need to draw more than two rays because four is a lot and they're all kind of confusing? No, I would say just pick the two easiest ones that you can draw, the easiest ones to remember, right? And then usually those will suffice I personally like to draw three um, just so I make sure I know what's what's going on. Um, I think, in my opinion, probably the easiest ones to remember, like how to draw, are probably the V for Vendetta one because it's just, you're going through the, um, what's it called? The vertex of the mirror. And then probably like the center of curvature one. However, they might not always label the center of curvature or that might not always be available to look at or something. So you definitely need to be adaptable. Like you can't just like to choose two of your favorite ones and like that's the end of it. You have to know how to use every single one. But the idea is that like when you're in the exam, whichever one is easiest to use and that's available for you to use, just use two of them and then you just, you're, you're set, right? You don't have to draw all four. I personally, like I said, I personally like to draw three just so I'm absolutely sure I'm drawing the image in the right place. But yeah, um, yeah, just two usually is, is, is what you have to draw. And then this page, I spent a lot of time to kind of like compile this stuff because this stuff I just hated, to be honest, uh, when I was studying for the MCAT, when I actually took the course, I just didn't like mirror stuff all that often. Um, so this is stuff that I learned from studying uh, the MCAT, and I think it's <clears throat> really helpful, um, like quick maths, quick tips, quick facts to visualize what's going on and figure out if you have a real virtual upright inverted image, whatever, right? <clears throat> so like I said earlier, all convex mirrors will create images that have the following characteristics. So if you have a convex mirror, the type of image that's formed is always the same. It's always smaller than the actual object, right? It's always upright. It's always like in the same vertical orientation as the object. And the image is always virtual, right? It's always virtual. The light rays do not converge. They always diverge. And they always seem to originate behind the mirror. But concave mirrors are a little bit more complex. There's different conditions here. So if the object is past the radius of curvature, like it's behind it, right? It's behind the center of curvature, right? So if it's like over here, or this is the center of curvature, right? Um, and remember the radius of curvature is just from the center to the vertex, right? So if it's behind the radius of curvature, if it's behind the radius, if it, or if it's behind the center, uh, that's what I meant. If it's behind the center, um, or if it's past it, right? Then the image formed will be small, inverted, and real. If the object is at the radius of curvature, if it's at that center, the image formed will be the same size inverted and real. If the object is between the radius of curvature and the focal point, right, so here's the center, here's the focal point, and if the object is over here and in between them, right, 
then the image formed is larger, inverted, and real. If the object is at the focal point, then no image is formed. But if the object is between the focal point and the vertex of the mirror, well, not, not this is my bad, it should be like this. If it's the focal point here, right, and your object is in between the focal point and the concave mirror's vertex, right, then the image formed is larger, upright, and virtual. And yeah, past center of curvature is sometimes referred to as an object at infinity, exactly. Yeah, because it could be like literally any distance past the radius of curvature or past the center of curvature. But this might seem like a lot to like memorize and stuff. Um, because you can, more or less, you can just like do your ray tracing and figure out all these different types of conditions. But sometimes it's like, it's helpful to know this because let's say, for example, you're on an exam, you have no idea how to do ray tracing. You've forgotten it. You're not sure about your rays or anything like that, right? But then there's other parts that might be asking about like, okay, what's the image distance or what's this or what's that, right? Well, or they might be just be asking like, oh, is the image formed virtual, real, inverted, flipped? Like there might be different parts of the question that might be asking you about those components. If you just know like roughly where those um, where the object is located relative to these different points with a concave mirror, you can pretty easily figure out if the object is has been magnified, if it's larger, if it's smaller, if it's upright, if it's virtual, if it's flipped, inverted, right? Um, it's just very helpful to know that. Plus, like, let's say you drew your, your rays and you have this stuff memorized. If, it, if you're drawn, like if your drawing does not match up with this stuff that you know, then that's a good sanity check and it'll help you like make sure that you're not drawing incorrect rays and not drawing incorrect stuff on the exam or the quiz. But um, yeah, that's a good question. If there are more physics two than physics one topics on the MCAT, really my experience with the MCAT is that just the exam as a whole, you cannot really bank on one subject being more prevalent than another because it just seems like every exam is just so drastically different. Like I had almost like no physics, like at all um, on my exam. Yes, their exams are standardized. So you do have like, you always have some of every subject, but it's like what they're testing you on each subject makes it feel at least that you're not being tested on it, right? So like when I took the exam, I didn't really have a lot of physics or it didn't seem like a lot of, a lot of physics because they just didn't test me on the, the hardest stuff right i didn't see any optics questions i didn't see any like um crazy um energy questions or torque or anything like that right it seemed like it was a lot more just like maybe like newton's laws or something right very um minute stuff compared to like more difficult stuff in physics so it just kind of depends but based on distribution of topics and what is likely likely to be more you know frequently tested i think i think it tended to consist more of like energy type questions um and optics because once again the mcat is the medical college admissions test so they're trying to ask you a lot of these questions not in a discrete manner that like, they won't just be like um what this is the focal length and this is the radius of curvature like uh, i don't know like uh, draw me some rays or you know figure out the location of this object. like they won't do that right they want to have things in relation to some medical context so like i was saying earlier they might say like okay this patient has myopia right um they might not even tell you the focal length or anything like that but they might ask you like what type of lens is needed to be able to correct their vision, right? So you have to be understand how they see, how they visualize things, those patients with that condition, and then obviously use physics and understand like what a diverging lens is, what a converging lens is, and we'll get into that in the next chapter here, um, and how like what kind of images are produced by those lenses to be able to fix or correct that condition. So I would say personally, like the, the, the amount of practice that I had the things that I saw, it seemed like it consisted more of things that you would expect there to be medical type questions of. So it was more like optics, energy, um, fluids, stuff like that. But 
like I said, it'll vary from exam to exam. Like some people might not get any optics questions like I did and only get like Newton's laws and torque and stuff like that. But other people might get really heavy exam on optics or, you know, um, and same for, for other things too. Like for orgo, like you might just get just SN1, SN2 stuff, but then for another exam, another person might just get like a bunch of um, just naming molecules, right? Which is far easier than like looking at mechanisms. So it just kind of depends. But yeah, it's not it's not exactly the same, but generally the things that are more like applicable and the things that I saw more practice questions on were the optics um, things. But yeah, optics and maybe like very minor stuff about electricity, very, very, very minor. Um, but yeah, generally optics and like energy stuff usually is what I saw. Because the energy stuff like can go in hand, hand in hand with chemistry because they could ask you a thermodynamics question and it'll tie hand in hand with physics. But yeah. Um, but hopefully this like little page here is helpful to kind of visualize and see and kind of almost almost kind of uses as a cheat sheet um, as a backup, you know, for the exam and stuff. But yeah. Now, there is a way to mathematically determine the location of an image, right? And we use this following equation here, right? So it's one over the distance of the object plus one over the distance of the image is equal to uh, one over the focal length, right? But you have to keep in mind the following sign conventions, which is that image distances are positive for real images and negative for virtual images. So it's not a matter of being on the left-hand side or the right-hand side or being, um, you know, like on the positive x-axis or the negative x-axis is just based on whether you have a real image or, an, or a virtual image, right? So real images are positive uh, image distances and then virtual images have negative image distances. Focal length is always positive for a concave mirror and it's negative for a convex mirror. And then physical objects always have positive distances. Then you have this magnification equation, which can also help you figure out if an image is inverted, upright, larger or smaller, right? So it'll take the height of the image divided by height of the object, or you can do negative of the image distance divided by the object distance, right? So like I said, HI and HO are the heights of the image and the object respectively. If you have a positive magnification, it means, means that the image is upright. A negative magnification means the image is inverted, right? So if you have a tree like this, right, and you get the image like that, then you should have a negative um, magnification value because that means that the image has been flipped or inverted. Magnification of just one means that the height of the image and the height of the object are the same. And if they're the same size, essentially, right? If you have greater than one, it means that the image size is larger. If you have less than one, it means that the image is smaller. Um, and I kind of mentioned this already, like with the concave mirror, right? There's different conditions. So if you were to have your object placed between the focal point and the mirror and the vertex of the mirror, then you see that the image formed is large, upright, and virtual, right? Um, almost everything else you can see is real, real, real. But if you have this one specific condition, you get a virtual image, right? And so it's not a matter of being on the left or the right side of the mirror to figure out your image distance. It's um, like, what did I want to say? It's a matter of having a virtual image or a real image. That's basically it. There's also image formation by refraction. I haven't really seen a lot of problems with this. In fact, there's not really many practice problems with this topic. So if you want, you can honestly, I don't want to say skip it, but because anything is possible at this point, but um, it's not, I mean, it's not a, a difficult topic anyway, to be honest. Um, it's more like equation based and it's very kind of like um, plug and chug kind of. So you can form an image by refraction and that's, like people might not understand initially like how that's possible, right? Um, 
But the idea is that you, everyone has seen this. It's just, I guess, you people weren't like aware that an image was forming by, by refraction. So the idea is that if you have that pencil in the cup of water, like I was saying, then what you see is that the pencil is bent a little bit and it seems to be kind of like at a lower height than it actually, or a lower depth than it actually is, or maybe at a higher depth or whatever, right? Depending on the light rays. So um, when light rays propagate from one medium to another, like from the air to the water, light rays are bent, like we said. And so whatever bending we perceive, we might see an image of the object that looks bent, like the pencil in the water, right? So the pencil might look like it's at a different depth than it actually is, and that's called apparent depth, kind of similar to like apparent weight, right? So you have the object at a specific, like, real actual height or depth called HO. Um, and then the observer, whoever's like looking at it, at the pencil, right, will see an image at the image height HI, right? Um, and then you can calculate this apparent height or the apparent depth of the refracted object by using the following equation, right? So you can figure out this apparent depth, um, and that's equal to the index of refraction of the observer divided by the index of the refraction of the object um, times the object height, right? Or the real object height. And so index refraction of the observer is just the index of the refraction of the medium that the observer is looking at, right? So if I'm in air, right? If I'm looking at the object from the perspective or from the index of refraction of air, basically, right? So I'm looking above, I'm not looking like, I'm not, underwater or anything like that, right? So I'm looking above in the air. Um, that's the index of refraction of me. That's the index of refraction of the observer. So I take that and divide it by the index of refraction of the object, which is the medium that the object is going through, right? So the pencil is going through water, right? So I take the index of refraction of water. And I just multiply by the object height or depth. And that's it. That's how I figure out the apparent depth of a refracted object. Um, there's drawings and stuff in the reading. I'm not entirely sure if you have to like really know that um, because it seems a little bit more complex. But yeah, I don't. You don't have to do like ray tracing or anything like this for for refraction, um, or at least for image refraction like this for for a medium like that. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much it for this. We went way above time, but I think that's more just due to the fact that. Um, we started a little late, but I've also outlined some important problems from the reading that I think you guys should go over. Um, this seems ridiculous, but the online homework and the written homework for the optic stuff is so immensely helpful as well. Like, I don't think there's a single bad problem so far, at least, that I've seen from the online and the written homework. I think they're all incredibly helpful to be able to get a lot of practice. And even if there are bad problems, like, you, for this, for this stuff, especially since it's so visual, you need all the practice you can get to be able to figure out how to draw this stuff. So I don't think there's a problem that stands out to me as being bad particularly. So I think honestly, like it, it might seem like a lot to do, but I mean, you guys have already done the online homework and the written homework, at least you should have, right? Um, so if you've done that already, just kind of like give it another look basically. I think that'll be great. And then just do these extra problems from the readings. Maybe just select a few of, one, of, of them that you want to do, um, and I think that should be pretty helpful. And then like I said, I have on the Google Drive, um, the extra practice problems, I have those uploaded already, uh, week 13, and then under that is the practice problems folder. If you hit that up, I think you should be able to find, yeah, yeah it, everything's uploaded for the rest of the semester. Um, so yeah, you should be able to find practice problems for the quiz that you guys have. But yeah, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and end the recording on that note and hopefully um, this was helpful, but yeah.